I think I've been lucky in that um, left bundle branch pacing sort of came in towards the second half of my fellowship and I got good initial training there and then coming back, um, you know, we, I'm in a sort of a, a teaching hospital slash research hospital, been able to kind of get a decent amount of volume. Um, and now I've been able to, in a position, lucky to be in a position where I proctor others in the country as well on, on left bundle pacing. So it's oh. not it's not something that you know is you can unfortunately like do you know and what after one case you're a master um but um it's it's nice to be able to kind of um be in a position that it, you know you can actually teach it because i do think that it's promising and look i'll i'll talk more about it in the in the in the presentation but um it's it's highly topical as you know it's very highly topical you know yeah I remember when, you know, the concept first came out, it just seemed absolutely insane. When you just hear about these people, like, wait, they're just drilling it. All right. And then yeah. it turns out all along, it might be a pretty good solution. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I suppose watch, watch this space in terms of all the studies coming out. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very promising. But yeah, drilling into someone's septum is a bit, uh, when, you, when you say it that way, it's, <laughs> it sounds um, pretty outrageous as long as you're septal i guess yeah i must say though it's um we use it a lot for our wide left bundle crt population and much quicker at this stage now it's much quicker much faster no contrast um more success um anecdotally so far and we're using it in a, re in a research capacity now i think we'll hopefully when the larger randomized studies come out um there'd be more of an argument to, to switch over you know but it's it's been quite quite interesting so you're you're currently doing an rct right now of crt versus um we are we're, we're so we we started with the initial kind of you know real world perspective sort of observational kind of data first of all and now we're going to move forward into rct data amongst um multi-center across the island you know that's that's the plan but we started with an initial feasibility studies. I mean, we'd already, we just, we, we built upon what's already been out there. Obviously, Ireland the population is going to be anything near enough what's, you know, the studies which are being um, published in Jack and HRS, but um, we are going to try and publish our, our nationwide data anyway, as a first off. That's amazing. Yeah. I have a few, if we have time at the end, I've, I have a few, I have one or two slides on like our center's experience so far. Would love to. Yeah, that would be amazing. I think that's, you know, it's, it's always good to see the data, but it's always so nice to see the subjective, you know, information mm -hmm. as well. So I guess it's yeah. technically objective. Perfect. I think we can probably kick off. I don't want to wait too much longer. I, I know one has stuff to do tonight. So. Great. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, Zane Sharif. I'm a cardiology EP consultant um, amongst uh, a couple of hospitals, the Bowman hospitals where I'm predominantly based in Ireland. Um, so I've been ta tasked with talking about left bundle branch area pacing, which is a very topical area in devices and EP. So just the structure of the talk. So why left bundle branch pacing? Why have we? Why are we even thinking about it? The anatomy pertinent to left bundle branch pacing. Some history. So how we actually got here to left bundle pacing from his pacing, and um, you know how it compares to CRT. And then how to do left bundle branch area pacing. So what you need, what what tools you need, and the step-by-step -step process and actually how you go about and do left bundle branch pacing. Uh, some real world cases, just to show you the flow of how we do these cases. And then 2022 and 2023, there's been a few large scale, um, predominantly observational studies, but there has been an RCT as well, which has emerged. And there's more obviously in the pipeline. Um, and then the limitations, um, obviously it's a new technology, um, but we'll talk more about um, the limitations of this technology as we move towards the end of the talk. So left bundle branch area pacing is a form of physiological pacing where we're using the native conduction system to achieve cardiac pacing. So we're not at pacing the muscle, we're trying to pace the actual electrical system. So it's particularly of interest where there is a high grade AV block, like two to one block or complete heart block. And there is a high expected pacing burden in the ventricle. Um, as we know, um, if you pace um, the ventricle the majority of the time, 
that can lead to things like uh, heart failure, heart failure hospitalizations, um, and worse outcomes long term. And this is, was seen in uh, studies such as the MOST and DAVID trial, which is why in a lot of the devices we try and program algorithms to reduce the amount of times we pace the ventricle. It's also of interest in CRT, where 20 to 30% of patients actually don't respond favorably. This can be also because a lot of the, sometimes there's not the coronary sinus anatomy to actually place the CS leads, um, or you're limited by phrenic nerve capture in areas where you want to pace, um, or you're just not getting great resynchronization because of just the anatomy that we have. And that's the most in David's study. We know that wide QRS is bad. So um, again, the predict HF study saw that if your paced QRS is greater than 190 milliseconds, you've more than um, more than half a chance of being admitted with heart failure um, over 40 months. We also know from the most study that the more pacing we did, the higher chance there was of heart failure hospitalization. So where else can we pace apart from traditional areas such as the RV apex. So RVOT, his bundle pacing obviously has um, been around now for some time. And LV septal pacing is now, uh, is what I'm gonna be talking about. That's one of the um, one of the areas of interest now in terms of trying to actually pace the electrical system to avoid all these problems with pacing the ventricle all the time. There has been some studies on like sort of clinical, like trial studies on pacing like a leadless pacemaker in the in the LV, but this is a very experimental and um, we won't talk about that today. There's um, obviously a lot of uh, um, concern about that type of strategy. Um, I'll skip over that. Um, very quickly, um, this was one of the papers that sort of is always quoted in the physiological pacing um, literature. Um, so study in 1970, where they looked at seven hearts of patients who had, who had died, and they looked at electrical activity, and they could see exactly where the earliest activity was. So you can see here that, um, you know, electrical activity starts high on the paraceptal wall, and then emerges a third of the way down from the apex to the base, and then goes to the septum and then to the um, lateral RV. So when we're pacing the RV septum, we're away from where the earliest activation should be. And we know that if the actual electrical system, sorry, this is a very busy slide here, but if you pace the electrical system, the, the conduction goes much quicker down to the down through the heart than if you're actually pacing the muscle. So in terms of just quick kind of history of physiological pacing, his pacing was first described about 50 years ago, in 1967 in dogs. And then this has led to study after study, which we won't go through now, but um, including studies which looked at using a His bundle lead, which is where we paste the His Purkinje system instead of doing a CS lead as part of CRT, with, re with reasonable um, results, but not on a large scale to displace uh, traditional CRT, which remains um, class one indication in many uh, situations in heart failure. But but why is pacing the His bundle um, not hasn't been sort of the holy grail of pacing the electrical system. So the natural electrical system, as you know, sinus node up here, at the top of the right atrium, then the AV node, then it goes through the His Purkinje system, and then a right bundle and left bundle. It can be tricky pacing the His bundle. It can be there's a lot of anatomical variation. Sometimes when we're doing His bundle pacing, we put a we put the catheter near the His bundle to try and find a His signal. And a lot of the time we can't actually find this His signal. Sometimes the thresholds are quite high. It needs a lot of you know, energy to actually pace the His. It's, his is a very well insulated structure. Um, you can often, because if you think about it, the his, is, his bundle is very close to the atrium. You can actually oversense the atrium quite often and undersense the R wave. Uh, nearly a quarter of the time, there can be an unstable position. These leads often fall out. And then the threshold can often rise later on as well. There's a steep learning curve. And again, if you have an anatomically abnormal right atrium, it can be quite tricky to um, get his bundle pacing. So then the um, left bundle area pacing um, came along. This is where we pace a bit further down in the electrical system into the left bundle. 
And I'll show you anatomically what that looks like in a second, but the first studies were in 2016, 2017, with interesting responses. We were able to narrow, they were able to narrow the QRS, um, you know, in a manner that was obviously much better than pacing the muscle in the right ventricular septum. And really the pioneers of this were in China with Dr. Huang, um, and then further embraced in the States with uh, Dr. Ellen Bogan, um, where with this type of pacing strategy, where you paced a bit further down in the electrical system, you could actually have reasonably stable output, and which was low as well, and seemed to get a lot more success than his pacing. These are the first screws, as you can see, very large sort of um, screws, which were used in, in dogs and then uh, goats. Um, but this, is, this technology has changed a lot more. And I'll tell you about the leads we use now. So how does left bundle pacing compare to his pacing? So low pacing thresholds, there's better R waves. And because there's a lower risk to develop distal conduction block, um, as the block is usually is located within the his or the proximal left bundle, um, it seems to get a bit better correction. And also there's a wider target for pacing compared to his bundle anatomically. And this is a really nice slide showing that. So this is the anatomy pertinent to left bundle pacing. So remember I was saying the AV node is up here. So, you know, AV node is up here, you have your AV, uh, proximal his bundle, you're branching sort of his bundle, and then you have your left bundle and your right bundle. And look how wide the left bundle is compared to the right bundle. It's like a large sheet of curtain. Um, so it's a much larger target than, for example, if you were, you know, we don't really do right bundle pacing. There are some studies looking at this, but left bundle pacing is it's a reasonably large target to actually get to. And um, this was a, you know, pretty interesting paper in 2019 where they looked at when patients have left bundle branch block, where exactly is the block? Because there's a theory of where it's called longitudinal dissociation. Essentially, if you pace further down than where the block in the electrical system is, theoretically, you should be able to correct the QRS, right? So in this study, they looked at consecutive patients, about 88 patients, and they tried to find out in patients with left bundle branch block, where is the block? And there was different uh, sort of variation where that block was, but the majority of people had block at the distal left-sided his fibers or proximal left bundle. So sort of up here. So if you think about it, if you pace further down, you're going to be a lot more likely in left bundle branch block to correct it. Is there any questions at this time? I know that I, this is it's a novel kind of sphere. Or like keep going. So I, I know I know you said that it's more likely to be on the uh, more proximal end. It, is there a risk of a more distal block in left bundle pacing? Um, in left bundle branch down, block? Yeah, down the road, for example. So um, it's, yeah. you know. It's a good question. Um, I suppose some progressive conditions, potentially like um, sarcoid infiltrative disorders or progressive MI, you, you could have, you know, uh, later on in the patient's life, develop distal conduction block. But the hope would be that this is bypassing and these are more these are durable results. Typically, I don't think you should expect to see a progression of block further down the road, down to the distal conduction fibers. And um, I think that's probably reflected in some of this, in these 88 patients in this paper. It was, really, it was interesting. It's sort of a wide range of patients. Um, but typically, they'd be sort of your clinical patients that you see with left bundle branch block, typically ischemic and not, and a mix of ischemic, non ischemic, I, I believe, um, at different stages of their kind of heart failure course. But across this spectrum, they found that the majority, so 50%, would have been in the sort of the proximal his here. 18% here in the left bundle. And then, you know, those with sort of intact Purkinje activation, there wasn't a lot of QRS correction. So you're right, if there is distal conduction block, sometimes you're not going to get as nice QRS narrowing than if it's where the majority of the time is, which is which is higher up, you know. But it does speak to, um, and I'll tell you kind of about my strategy of doing left bundle pacing. I usually go a bit more distal rather than higher up. Um, usually the left bundle target is about 15 millimeters down from the his bundle. So it kind of lands you here, but I find myself often kind of aiming towards this area um, or kind of this area here, sort of like just before the, where you expect the bifurcation to the e bush. Um, we'll talk about that later on. 
again going back to anatomy so if this is the his, if this is your tricuspid valve imagine you're an RAO and you've got right atrium here and your right ventricle here and your RVOT is sort of popping up this way if your his bundle is over here your left bundle is going to be about 15 millimeters further down and this sort of like shadow this kind of shadowed outline this tracing here with your sort of left conduction system so you're kind of aiming you know just in the meat of it really you know and i'm sure aj you probably remember when, when i were there we were kind of doing a few um uh we were doing so a lot of left bundle pacing after tavers um because a lot of the time these patients develop like left bundle branch block but it would be iatrogenic and high up you know they would be sort of up here knocking up the hiss so if you think about it you're bypassing that early sort of distal conduct like early conduction sort of block and by pacing distal to it you we often in these cases we're getting almost normal qrs's you know like 88s uh, you know pretty nice qrs narrowing again just another slide pertaining to anatomy so what is the definition of left bundle pacing so capturing the left bundle branch um, usually with myocardial capture at low output so less than one volt a point for is it's so the very there's a lot of variation in what's defined as left bundle branch pacing or left bundle branch area pacing um, but this is one that was mooted earlier and we talked about this already sort of the, kind of the benefits of why we think it seems to be quite promising it holds a lot of promise in resynchronization so it carries the advantage of achieving left septal conduction system capture um, in addition to LV endocardial pacing with just a single point pacing, so rather than pacing the RV and the CS, you're sort of just pacing the left bundle. You know, you're avoiding two leads and you're just putting one lead in. Um, and then there seems to be on EP testing of the heart and PET imaging of the heart. that There's probably a bit more natural conduction through the heart rather than with CRT. But again, this is all experimental data. Um, it just is sort of kind of adds to the promise of it. Um, so how do we do this? So there's two ways of doing left bundle branch pacing. Um, there's a, a method with luminless leads. So like the 3830 is, a, is the lead that's been used for his bundle pacing where there's actually no stylish. It's just, it's like a screw in. So you have your, you have your, your lead and once your lead tip is in contact with the area you want to drill into, you manually sort of rotate and drill it into the septum. The other um, method is where you actually have a stylish. So like your, your standard leads, you know? So um, we use a bit of biotronic um, uh, left bundle area pacing because biotronic have actually gotten CE marking. So more recently, which means they're, you know, if there's any sort of headaches in terms of, oh, is this device MRI compatible, blah, blah, blah. Um, you have a lot more, you know, there's a bit more sort of, uh, of a leg to stand on you know so it's something that in europe now um i, I should add um so it's something that we've we've a bit of more experience with recently and then in that case you're almost like you have a delivery sheet which gets you to the left bundle you get your lead in proximity with the conduct where the where you want to sort of target and then you build up torque and then you manually go but you have your helix extended um at which are lumen and which are sort of styled in the lead and then you sort of manually drill it then as well. But I'll, I'll talk through sort of like um, a step-by-step -step process. I'll only focus on the luminous lead just because there is variations and we'll just focus on one type of way of doing it. So for both types, we should have uh, a 12 lead ECG continuously recorded. So I know that can sometimes be a limitation. So access to that can be challenging, but so having a 12 lead um, on the patient's chest and that's hooked up to a screen that you can see. So you can actually see at least the um, at least the limb leads, and at least V one V six. Ideally, ideally you get a full twelve lead. But then this will allow you to sort of confirm that you are in the area you want to be, and that you're capturing the left bundle. So that can be a limitation if you don't have access to a continuously running twelve lead, and um, and uh, ideally a monitor to to sort of see what you're doing as you're going along. There are other EP systems where you can actually look at your intracardiac electrograms, but Again, it's more expensive. It's harder to get. And, uh, you know, we've moved away from that because I think you can do it without it. Um, so again, left-sided access is preferred. So if you're talking about the Medtronic system, there can either be a deflectible or undeflectible system. Um, I, I've moved more to a, a fixed sheet. So it's not a sheet that you can, you know, you rotate and the, 
the cat, the sort of the tip of the sheet moves up and down. It's sort of a fixed sheet that you basically, you get your access, um, you know, you put your sheath and wire through your access point with wire into the IBC. You drag your sheet down into the right atrium. You sort of clock and bring the wire back and then wire, try and wire into the right ventricle and then sort of rail your sheath into the right ventricle that way. And again, I've, I've um, some chest X-rays and fluoros to kind of show that. Um, if you have a left bundle branch, like in CRT, like with a CS lead, I usually put the atrial lead in the ventricle because if you think about it, if you have a left bundle branch block and you bump the right bundle, you can get complete heart block and that's a lot of drama. You don't want that. So I usually put, like I get double access. I put the atrial lead in the ventricle and just let it sit there um, and then have it as a backup. And then what I do is I use the left bundle that get the left bundle lead in afterwards. So there's two ways to do it. You can do it anatomically or looking for like a his signal and then a left bundle signal. But again, a lot of sometimes in left bundle branch block, you don't, it's for, so hard to find a left bundle uh, signal. And also, again, that needs more expensive gear that can sometimes be harder to get. So that's why I think um, sort of, in, especially when you're sort of resource constrained, you know, starting off with trying to just get 12 EBCGs and looking at a monitor is, I think, more, is more than enough an anatomical approach. So again, like I said, uh, what I would do is when I, once I have the wire in the IVC and I bring it up, um, I'm doing this in RAO to see my right atrium and right ventricle. And then I wire into the right ventricle and then I drag the sheath over the in dilator, uh, sorry, the sheath into the right, right ventricle. Um, trying to get as distal, trying to get reasonably distal, maybe halfway between the tricuspid annulus and the apex. Um, and then I remove the wire. And the way these delivery sheets are, it should bounce into the, um, it should bounce against the septum. Um, so again, it's clocked to sort of move and counter to get against the septum. So with a bit of manipulation, you should be able to sort of land it kind of resting against the septum. And so in RO, you kind of want it about one, two o'clock, and then in LAO, two to three o'clock. And again, I have um, images about uh, looking at that. There's a nice paper, Huang's group, the Chinese group I talked about has, which is called a beginner's guide to permanent left bundle branch pacing. And that's in heart rhythm, I think in 2019, actually, 2019. And when you mentioned yeah, clock there, so you're mentioning clock to get through the valve, right? So you go more yes. interior to get Correct. through the valve. So navigating past the valve, clocking, and then, or sorry, clocking, and then counter clocking to get more septal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then these are sort of the electrograms that you will see once you start to um, pace. So let me see here. Um, yeah, once I'll get back, I'll go back to the slide in a second. But once your sheet is in position, so at this stage now, the delivery sheet is halfway between the valve and the apex. You thread, you sort of, you pass your lead, your 3830 uh, luminous lead to the tip of your sheath and have it in contact with the myocardium. At this stage, we unipolar pace. So um, we have the black, you know, alligator on the lead tip and then the um, red clip on the patient. And that's your unipolar pacing. And then you're looking for a particular signal, which suggests you're in the right area. And that signal is like a notched W in V1. You're looking for disconcordance. And what I mean by that is that your, you know, two is sort of opposite to your three and your AVR is sort of looks opposite to your AVL. So it sort of means that you're in the middle of the heart. So you're in the septum. So if you think about two and three are the opposites and AVR, AVL are sort of opposites. It should place your sort of lead sort of in the middle of the heart, kind of where you want to be, which should be sort of the middle septum. Um, so at this stage, then you take your initial bites. So I usually double glove at the start of my case. At this stage, I remove one set of gloves. This is something that I learned, you know, was taught in Mass General. And at this stage now, you're you've a bit more sort of, um, bit more sort of um, uh, firmness to kind of your grip onto the lead, and you sort of like, like you, you know, you sort of like rotate. I rotate with two fingers. I build up torque with one, and um, sort of like do a couple of turns. And then I unipolar pace as well. And the what you ideally looking for, and this is going back to that slide. And then this is, you know, this is that W I talk about, that notch and a W. You see that there? 
um, and sort of that disconcordance where AVR and AVN are negative are sort of opposite to each other. Two and three can be somewhat opposite to each other, and you have that W. And then as you screw in, you kind of progressively move towards a right bundle branch block. So if you think about it, if you paste the left bundle, you know, you're going quickly down the left, left bundle branch. So your right bundle is going to be a bit slower than if you if you get me, right? So you should kind of get like a right bundle Lloyd appearance. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So you're looking for this R prime sort of like creeping up um, as you drill in. The other thing you look for is something called your LVAT to reduce. So this is, um, it's a new con it's a new concept. So it's for, it's something that we target when resynchronization. It's where your V6, your stim, where your unipolar pacing to the peak of your R wave, that's your left ventricular activation time. So if that's wide, it's taking a long time for your vent left ventricle to activate. Whereas if you think about it, if you paste the left bundle branch, it's going to be activated a lot quicker. So this LVAT will narrow up. And you see here as the drill progressively deeper and deeper and then eventually hit the left bundle, that LVAT slowly narrows, narrows, narrows. And to me, that's often more important than the QRS narrowing. So I look at the LVAT predominantly. I look at for this R prime, and that tells us that we're pacing the left bundle um, pretty nicely. Uh, now, a quick question to that point here. Uh, so we're yes. looking for QRS narrowing. Um, so from the LV, or from the initial pace, unipolar pace, do you count the QRS from the beginning of that pace, or do you count from the beginning of the deflection if there's, um, you know, isoelectric? Yeah, it's, to it. a, it's a good point. I actually, um, I don't look at the QRS during this period of time. I look at the LVAT. But if I were to look at the QRS, it's a good question. Um, probably the start of the deflection, because it's probably the start of the deflection, because that's what, you know, I mean, if you talk about latency, but um, there's another way to kind of get around latency, but that's kind of another, I'll, I'll briefly touch upon that later on. Latency is where you pace and diseased muscle and it takes time to actually go through the muscle and then hit the electrical system. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I look at the LVAT. So a drop of more than 10 milliseconds acutely or less than probably 100 milliseconds of LVAT, ideally below 85, um, is when you kind of hit the left, you know, when you're pacing the left bundle branch. Um but yeah, QRS narrowing is obviously what's desirable um, as well. So again, this is kind of what we're looking at. So if we have some limb, if we have some leads, this is our V1. Um, this is before we screw, you have that W sign. And then after you screw in, uh, sorry, this is pre-screw, this is post-screw. Um, you get that cure, you get a bit of QRS narrowing. Um, there's a better, there's some better slides later on showing you sort of like a, a case where we kind of go through this. So I'll, I'll focus on that. But yeah, so that right bundle branch pattern with the V1, so with the, in V1 with that R wave coming up, like I showed here, uh, where is it going? This R prime coming up here from this, that's what one of the things you're looking for. And the LVAT, which is the stem to the peak of the R wave in V6 narrowing up as well. And that is the stim, the unipolar stim, to the peak of the um, R wave narrowing up as we're drilling. And you see here, that's much shorter than what it was here. Those are like, if you, if you take away two things about when you're drilling, what you, what you look for is the, that R prime and that LVAT alpha, alpha narrowing down. Um, okay. Um, won't go into selective versus non-selective. It's kind of similar to, to his pacing, you know, Selective is where you're just pacing the left bundle system. Um, but it can be useful. Um, it's when you kind of, if you're non-selective, you're kind of pacing the muscle and the left bundle. If you're just pacing the left bundle, that's selective. But we'll kind of skip over that. So, yep. So I talked about the LVAT narrowing down. This is another sort of way of... Um, knowing if you've got left bundle area pacing. So we won't, we'll just touch on it very briefly. Um, again, like I said, if I wanted to remember two things about how you get left bundle pacing, it's that LVAT narrowing up and the R prime emerging, but this can, can be useful. It's where V6, like the R wave in V6 to the R wave in V1 
uh, goes over 40 milliseconds. Um, and that sort of kind of tells us that our left bundle is being activated. So remember our, our LVAT's narrowing right up. So left bundle, like the left bundle is a surrogate. So if you think about V6 as a surrogate for your left bundle and V1 as a surrogate for your right bundle, your left bundle is being activated way quicker. And then you see here the R wave in V1 is much later. So if that sort of prolongs out more than 40 milliseconds, that sort of again tells you that you're pacing the left bundle system. Does that make sense? I'll repeat that again. So for if V6, if you think about V6 equals the left bundle system and V1 is equal to right bundle, LVAT's narrowing up. So that'll kind of, this will come here and this will stay out here. So this is kind of prolonged, get more than 40 milliseconds. Um, I, I, I probably wouldn't um, use this as an indicator because I don't look for left bundle potentials. I think it's, it can be useful if you have the resources. Um, and the, But um, again, a lot of patients don't have left bundle potentials. But this is sort of what you'd see on a recording system if you'd see it. Okay, so some um, images, which people like. Um, this is a case of, uh, of uh, upgrade. Somebody already has an ICD in place. Um, this is our sheet and our left bundle lead is um, adjacent to where we need to be. And the other thing, yes, so when we're drilling in, we sometimes shoot some contrast just to make sure, see what our contact is like and to make sure as well, some, there are septal perforators which sometimes run down here. So if you inject contrast and you see contrast going up the septal perforator, you withdraw and you go again. And again, you might think, oh, that sounds really, really bad. But off, most, like the vast majority of the time, there's, it's because these are such small arteries, they sort of seed over and there's no real compromise. But that's why, again, it's important to look at, have a 12 lead because again, looking for ischemic changes during a case is important, you know, especially if the patient has gotten a lot of sedation. So yeah, this one is in reasonable contact. You ideally want the tip and the ring in contact with the, with the muscle, sorry, with the septum, because you want it to be stable. And this is what the final position would look like. So this is LAO. Remember, the septum is in LAO is kind of in the middle. So you want to be drilling into the septum. And it looked like this eventually. So you see here the ring and this way, the, the lead tip and the ring are in proximity with the um with the septum. In RAO, this is what the what it looked like. So this is a, a nice schematic, I thought, you know, of what you'd, you know, if you're kind of visualizing where the conduction system is like, you would have your, you know, your uh, lead in your RV apex. And if your his bundle is here, you sort of would be aiming around here. I usually aim like the middle third of the septum. I just think that you bypass that sort of like where most of the um, conduction block is in left bundle branch. Um, that's less of a problem if you're pacing in young, you know, patients who are who are young and need pacing a lot of the time, and you're doing it because you want to avoid a pacing cardiomyopathy uh, down the road. So someone say who's in their forties and they could be heart block, and um, you know they're going to pace nearly all the time. And to avoid them getting a cardiomyopathy, you're doing conduction system pacing. So you're actually pacing the left bundle system to avoid that. How does it look like on chest X-ray? So yeah, like you're thirty-eight thirty. Lead is sort of like you want a little heel, a bit of slack there at least, because you know these are these that can be you know ripped out if you don't have enough slack. If they're just like if you have the lead here and it's just going up like this, it's going to come out. So you usually want a bit of slack resting in the right atrium. And you always and a lateral chest X-ray will look like this, so it kind of it's coming towards you. So just another quick kind of clinical case. So this is one. Um, that we had with actually Dr. Actually, yeah. So anyways, it's an 81 year old patient, uh, persistent AFib, uh, syncope, pre-syncope, unremarkable World Cup. 2020 came to the ER with syncope and had AFib with heart failure in the forties. So this is their echo, normally F, posterior leaflet, mitral valve prolapse, moderate MR. Uh, they had a dual chamber pacemaker put in. But then presented with dyspnea and were found to have signs of overload and heart failure. Uh, no prior history of heart failure. And the device looked okay. This is the chest, the echo. So you see the EF is down a bit, 45%, and there's diffuse hypokinesis. So the chamber isn't pumping, you know, perfect at all. And there's moderate to severe MR. You see this massive amount of MR, and there's a bit of TR as well. So that's not good. 
And what we found out is that he was pacing 100% of the time, which was probably the cause of um, why he developed a cardiomyopathy. And they did a, this is just, they just saw there was no ischemia um, on a pet. So what next? Rhythm control with antiridmics versus ablation, upgrade the CRT or, you know, intervention. So I'll, I'll skip, uh, skip to the chase. We went for a CRT upgrade because we felt this was a pacing cardiomyopathy. And I think previously they had, you know, failed rhythm control. And it seemed like that was the cause, you know, a couple of months after pacing 100% of the time to start developing a cardiomyopathy, you know, they did AFib for a while before. So some nice uh, CS intra-procedure images. Um, so just doing a venogram during the case, placing a CS lead. Unfortunately, um, chest X-ray afterwards showed instead of upturned CS lead, that the CS lead is sort of dislodged and doesn't turn upwards at the end. So that, again, that's not good. So we did a lead revision, but then again, there's a large prior to splitting the sheath and we plugged the LV port. So um, patient remained stable, but the EF was low and they just weren't themselves, a lot of heart failure symptoms. So at this stage, what we did was we went for conduction system pacing. And again, we use a 3830 lead. Um, this case, we use the deflectible sheet, but again, I don't use a deflectible sheet. Again, I use the, the, the non-deflectible, but you know, it, it's, there's no right way of doing it. Like there's two sheets um, for Medtronic and, you know, pe some people have different preferences, but um, this is sort of like our, our step-by-step -step with reuse. So in RAO, we are a third of, kind of a third of the way down from where the, you'd expect the valve to be maybe slightly, maybe the first third, maybe the apex is about here. So we have the sheet sort of pointing against the septum in RAO and in LAO, Again, it's like two to three o'clock. So you always want this like maybe ideally about two o'clock in um, RAO and in LAO you want it about two to three o'clock. And if, when we say that, we imagine there's a, there's a watch face here. So like I said, we did unipolar pacing. There's a W and it's before we screw. And we start to screw in, we give contrast. You can see here we're well lodged in. And then we're well stable then. So this is the um, ECG at the end of our case. So QRS was 115. It's a tiny bit of an R prime, like you'd expect with the R. Remember I was saying, with, if you're pacing the left bundle system, you want a tiny bit of an R prime there, um, which is that R wave there. And then you can almost imagine this, this LVAT where there's a stim so you can you can look at it like an LVAT on ECG as well. So that's where like your stem here, you can see the stem artifact, the peak of the R wave in V6. And that's definitely less than 100 milliseconds. So three months later, much better. EF is 57%. And where is all the MR gone? It's much better. And the TR is much better as well. So kind of coming to the end of the talk now. So just some recent studies. So there's been three large recent studies. Also, well, two kind of large recent studies and one randomized studies, which are all showing promising initial outcomes data for left bundle branch pacing in the resync uh, cohort of patients, so patients who traditionally get CRTs. So this was a randomized study of left bundle branch pacing uh, CRT versus biventricular pacing with a CS lead. And this demonstrated superiority of left bundle branch pacing in LVF improvement, favorable reduction in ensystolic volumes and BNP were observed in the left bundle CRT group. But I have to say, it's, a, it's only 40 patients. There's a bit of crossover as well. This is just sort of like initial sort of food for thought, initial sort of promising data that we know is being built upon. But it did sort of have us, um, it was very exciting initial randomized study to kind of, um, to kind of look at. And then this year, there's been um, some interesting studies as well. So this perspective multi-center observational randomized, non-randomized study looked at about maybe 400-ish patients of CRT, um, traditional CRT versus left bundle branch CRT. And you can see here that there was better changes in EF with the left bundle branch area pacing. There's less long-term complications. There's better symptomatic improvement with the left bundle branch area pacing. And with BIV pacing being orange and uh, LB pa left bundle pacing being blue, um, 
there was actually improvements in the composite endpoint of heart failure hospitalizations and all-cause mortality. But again, with observational non-randomized studies, you always have to bear in mind that there could be cherry picking in terms of these cases. Um, you know, there are some some slight variations in the patient um, demographics, I believe. Um, but again, it's you know about four hundred patients. It's 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 you know re decent numbers, and that was built upon in this study, which only came out last month and um, presented a heart rhythm as a late breaking trial of about uh, one thousand, nearly one thousand eight hundred patients. So big big numbers. And this looked at left bundle branch area pacing as initial CRT strategy. Um, and what they found that it resulted in lower risks of heart failure related hospitalizations compared to BIV pacing with a CS lead, uh, a reduction in procedure time, a reduction in floral time, shorter paced QRS duration, improvements in left ventricular ejection fraction compared with biventricular pacing as well. So very, very interesting data. Um, we have to build upon this data, but you know, if it has a scope to make a, you know, sometimes a very long, arduous procedure, a bit narrow. I mean, this it does remain a challenging procedure to do, but you know, it it it's you know with the it's something that if you do master, um, and the data is there behind you, that it's a very useful tool in your locker to learn. Um, so there are concerns, obviously, if you're you know placing the lead multiple times it might cause tissue damage right bundle damage septal artery damage you know there's this is only a recent kind of you know thing that's come around since 2017 there's not a lot of long-term data we don't know what having a lead in the septum does over decades you know especially if you're thinking about a, a 40 40 year old with complete heart block um, and you're going to be having a pacemaker in for hopefully decades um you don't know what that sort of myocardial contractile strain does on these deep-seated leads for long periods of time. How do we extract these leads? Now, one thing that has been said about this, this is brought up at a lot of meetings, is that, well, we actually seem to be able to restract, uh, extract his leads pretty easily. Like the 3830 Medtronic lead is, is you know, has good experience in terms of extraction. But um, this, these are a bit more deep-seated. You know, these are um, a bit deeper in the conduct in the muscle itself. So, you know, if we have a patient who gets infected and the lead is compromised in that infection, that is something that we should obviously have in mind and something we should can be consenting these patients for, you know. Um, as AJ was saying, the phenotype of these heart failure patients, you know, it's all very, these patients have different, you know, reasons why they get heart block and it might not fit, you know, the standard patient who gets one. So that's something to bear in mind, especially if you have a genetic cardiomyopathy and, you know, it's, um, you know, obviously in these cases, you usually want an ICD lead in place. But well, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the patients who might benefit the most from it um, remains to kind of be defined. And there's more evidence for CRT and his pacing at this time, but at the rate of sort of these, re these studies are being released, I anticipate that there will be more promising data in the near future. So we do need more large-scale randomized studies comparing left bundle area pacing versus CRT and long-term durability. And then the gear that we use to actually get left bundle branch pacing is also evolving. And that's the sheets, that's the you know, systems, the leads. Um, these are all being evolved at the moment. So it's, again, I think in the future, it'll likely be the pacing method of choice in younger patients needing pacing, um, those with high expected pacing burden, and potentially in the realm of resynchronization it's very helpful and one thing i didn't mention is that if you have a it's very helpful in left bundle branch uh, sorry in cs bailout so say if you're doing a crt and you dissect the coronary sinus i had a case like this a month ago i was like okay fine let's just do a left bundle area pacer so we just put a left bundle um pacemaker in at the same time and we walked away from there um so it can be very helpful in that case or if you're not getting great qrs narrowing you just have no targets during the case so that's called bailout left bundle pacing um so that's it um i have a few slides on our institute's experience i don't know aj do I have time to sort of like one or two slides to throw those up but... absolutely yeah i think we have some time here cool all right so yeah look um i started doing this um since i came back i was initially you know initially in mass general we had been doing this in our sinus node dysfunction patients. So like patients who didn't really need it just in case there was any issues with the leads long-term. But, th and those are the patients I would recommend if you do have that sort of privilege to sort of start in patients with left with sort of sinus node dysfunction, 
or who you know really need an atrial lead, um, those are the patients you'd ideally do. If you are doing it for heart block patients, I probably recommend having a backup RV pacing lead. That's what I did at the start as well, um, in case there's any issues with like lead dislodgements. And once you're comfortable after your learning curve of putting them putting in quite a few in, um, then you you know you're easy, you can start just putting in the left bundle lead. But I I would probably recommend at the start putting it in patients who don't need even like like they just need an atrial lead or you have a backup RV lead. Um, or potentially CRT where you have the ICD lead in anyway, which could pace if there's any issues. But um, that's where I'd start. So that's where I started when I came back to, to Ireland. And then um, we started doing it a bit more. In our institute, this is our, we've done a bit more since this. Since this, this is our abstract that we sent for our national meeting, the Irish Cardiac Society. So <laughs> there was about 17 patients. And um, I don't actually have the demographics here. I should have put it up, but we were on average able to reduce our, the mean QRS in these patients from about 160 milliseconds to about 116. Um, we were able to get that LVAT to about 86. So remember you were saying ideally below 100 is good. We were getting these LVAT drops in all cases, a decent V6, V1 interpeaks. So that's your left bundle to right bundle sort of time activation. Um, and one only one patient had a complication of lead dislodgement, but that was our first, very first patient, actually. So we have had none since. As you can imagine these are well drilled in. So if you have a lot of slack, you're usually doing okay. Um, one thing I will say is that when you're when you are drilling these in, we keep an eye on the impedance because if the impedance drops, especially below 450, 400, that might mean that you've gone to the other side. So that might mean you've gone through to the left ventricular cavity. If that happens, you take the lead out, you you have to either take off whatever myocardium is in the lead or get a new lead. Um, ideally, obviously, you don't want to be using more than one lead. So usually end up just like using saline to wash the lead or scrape out a bit of the muscle there and then try again in another place. But it's important to keep an eye on the impedance as you're drilling in as well. So usually it's about 700, 800 is the impedance. Um, to, to confirm on that, I've heard that in the yeah. past is the impedance will have an initial rise. So you'll have like around three, 400, and you'll see a rise to seven, 800. Correct. And then will it plateau then? And then it starts to drop as you come out the other side or what? Absolutely. So you might have a slight impedance drop as you're approaching the other side. <laughs> what you want is to, you want to maintain your current of injury. Because if your current of injury goes, that might mean that you're actually getting too close to the, um, getting too close to the um, uh, LV cavity or getting through going through and through, which is what you don't want. And you can have late, you can have late uh, sort of dislodgements where you go right through as well, but that's where you're keeping your an eye on your impedance. If you've good impedance and you've good current of injury at the end, you you shouldn't really be going through late. Um, the other thing is in these patients, so seven out of nine of our heart failure patients had a follow-up echo and the, the results were pretty interesting. I'll show that, but the mean EF improved from 17 to 20%, 27% after only six weeks. And that's expected to go up further, you know, as the months go on um, until they plateau, you know, but again, and a statistically significant decrease in NYHA class, again, that's subjective, you know, it's really hard to kind of tell, um, you know, subjectively ask patients, you know, their heart failure class, but interesting. So this was sort of our EF. So you see here is some nice jumps in the EF in a lot of, in most of our patients. One patient had stabilization. And as you know, in CRT, even a CRT EF stabilization can be important as well. This is a patient with genetic cardiomyopathy and the NYH classes were getting better. The end diastolic volumes were getting better. Um, so all very promising. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I know it's a lot of information. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I know it's very different to anything we've done before here. Well, that was that was fantastic, and I apologize. It's probably a little background noise here, but that was that was an amazing talk. Um, I we have the chat open if anyone wants to ask any questions in the chat, or feel free to to chime in if you have anything off the bat. I know I have a few, but I'd like some other people to ask some questions if they're ready. Okay, well, I'll chime in. Uh, so I, I did want to ask, where do you see left bundle in the next few years? You know, the, the evolution of it. Do you see, you know, a left bundle CRT or do you think it's a standalone kind of thing? I know that's kind of a vague question, but maybe you can have some input on that. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to get, you know, study after study. This is like the new sort of like, you know, sexy form of pacing, you know, so uh, a lot of centers have taken it on. A lot of centers are doing large, you know, randomized studies on this uh, or large sort of sort of studies and hopefully some randomized studies coming soon. I think in those who are expected to pace a lot of the time, so especially the young 50 year old who's got complete heart block, that's the patient I think who's going to, you know, really benefit from this. I think the wide left bundles, I think dis, dis, like dyssynchronous heart failure patients, I think it would probably be the de facto form of resynchronization in these patients in time. I think that's a big statement, but I think that the studies will come um, to show that will be the case. And um, yeah, I think, you know, anyone who's got a high expected pacing burden will probably end up th the benefit more from this because it might, it means that it might save them in four or five years or even sooner coming back into your hospital with heart failure, um, you know, which is a big thing. Perfect. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I, I think it would be very impactful here where resources, you know, aren't always available. But one concern, I guess, is uh, what about cheese, right? If we're not able to acquire cheese and mass for these kind of procedures, um, are there other ways to deliver without a pre-shaped sheath? Is there ways to, you know, manipulate existing products or do you think that's out of the question? Um, so I think, you know, a lot of the sheets that we have are based on the HIS bundle pacing experience, you know, so um, there are sheets in development specifically, specifically for left bundle pacing that are being developed and Hopefully they're you know readily available in time. Um, I don't think you can sort of you know. I mean the sheets that are there for his pacing seem to work for left bundle pacing. I don't. I think they are the sheets that are on the market at the moment, and that's what's um, what I've been using anyway for Medtronic in Boston. I've been using the the sort of the the fixed sheet and the Biotronic you know sheet that they have as well. Um, I, I take your point about, res, you know, resources. I think I alluded to it. I think the EP recording systems for left bundle potentials and all that, I don't think you necessarily need to use those. I know that's, that's a lot of centers, they sort of swear by them, but I think if you do it anatomically, um, I think the biggest thing will be like, you know, getting a 12 lead or, you know, at least get some of your ECG, uh, tracings continuously recorded. So you could, do this. I think that'll be probably be one of the limiting factors. Um, so that's something that'll probably need to be looked at. So I think until that's the case, I think use continue to use CRT is probably the most practical area. And regardless, you know, CRT is a class one indication that has lots of data behind it. It's, you know, um, it's evidence-based, whereas left bundle isn't on a large scale yet, you know. So we're using I'm in a teaching research institute. So that's why I've been, why, why I have been using it, you know, um, but um, I think the data will come out. I see, uh, Ijim, you have a hand up as well. Dr. Dr. Akuru. Oh, oh, <laughs> Dr. Akuru, how are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you again. You too. So um, I had a question and maybe this is just, uh, this is just a thought in my mind. So you know, the CRT studies that were done, you know, everybody came to the conclusion that the QRS doesn't matter, right? That, you know, if you have a good position, no matter what the QRS is, you know, your results don't really depend on the QRS. And so that's what we've sworn by. So even though we kind of feel great when the QRS gets narrow, we don't really aim for that when we're doing a by the, you know, either PACE or ICD, right? Um, but with left bundle, you know, that's kind of part of the um, procedure is that you expect to see a narrower QRS. So do you think that might um, explain the differences and results that we're seeing in historical CRT versus, you know, left bundle pacing? And, you know, you might not have the answer to this, but I'm just thinking out loud here. It's a it's a good question. So to, to sort of... Um get your question right it's um it's the surrogate marker we're looking at for resynchronization it might not be the right one is that sort of what is that what you're asking in terms of like is the QRS really right. 
Yeah, okay. well, because this is the thing, right? Like, yeah. so everybody is like, oh, Love Bundle is so great. Love Bundle is so great, right? Yeah. And, but the things that we're looking at are kind of different, right? So the success rate, the success of CRT is just based on you getting it in and yeah, 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 it pacing, yeah. no matter what the QRS is. We don't I, try to program for the QRS. I agree. I think it'd be interesting to look at things like maybe your your QLV or like your best optimized, you know, resynchronization um, sort of group in a CRT within a CRT group versus your left bundle patients who, you know, peep, you know, there's a luxury of these studies of like looking for really narrow LVATs, like for really perfect V6, V1s. Um, and perhaps maybe that is why they're seeing such a difference in all these large observational studies. And I think any, I think you're right. I think uh, any well-designed randomized study should probably, when you're looking at your CRT arm, making sure you're doing CRT right and then comparing it. Because certainly the left bundle cohort, they're being done right. You know, they're, um, there's probably a, a, a desire to make it look nice as well. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I, I take your point. I think definitely in these studies, you need to make sure both arms are are optimized. I think that's a really interesting point that, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about, but that was also a big point when I was working in the industry is, um, you know, we are strong believers in our adaptive AV delay technology, right? Like Sync AV or Adapt A that Medtronic has. And there was a lot of pushback from different EPs that, oh, you know, this has too much RV activation in it. And the argument is like, well, it's a narrow QRS and typically that's what we look for. But a lot of people want to just see greater LV activation versus if we're selecting, if we're programming for a narrow QRS, would we have a similar outcome versus uh, it's a really good yeah. question. I don't know. It is. Yeah. I, I do. I do believe in this LVAT. I do believe in this sort of like, I, I look at the LVAT more than I look at the QRS, you know, and some of our super responders in the in that heart failure group had like, maybe the QRS wasn't, you know, it was, it was nice. It would have gone down to like, you know, 120s and whatever, but um you know, the LVAT would be nice and narrow or that V6, V1 would be nice and narrow or nice and wide in, in that instance. And their EF just, you know, jumps up. Um, so again, it's it's the right prompt. I mean, again, it's evolving as well. What are the right targets in these patients to to look at? Um, it would be nice if it did work because it is, it is, I think it's easier. I think it's, you know, less floored. It's much quicker. Like we're doing these in less than an hour mostly now, um, you know, much less contrast. You know, not everyone has a good CS. So, you know, you're going to get, you are going to get more people eligible for this or who will respond by virtue of the fact that traditionally 20 to 30% of the patients don't respond to CRT, even in the best centers, you know. So um, if this is the holy grail, it, it, it does, um, it's good news for heart failure patients. But so you did mention risk. I we did. I saw that one on Twitter. I don't know if you saw, uh, yeah. but someone had some edema, some septal edema from one of these going in. Yeah. Um, have there been a lot of examples, or is that fairly rare? And then other risk as far as you yeah. know, implant technique, um, doing actually perfing if you're not septal. Yeah. Um, have you seen anything like that, or is there any high risk of that? I've I've seen that was an impressive case with the hematoma. Um, yeah, they stopped, the, they stopped the anticoagulation, and uh, yeah, it was, it was amazing. The images were amazing, like, but um, I think with the uh, there, I think they, those to be fair are rare, you know. And in these case series, you know, the, the one where there's 18,000 patients, and you know, most of the studies, which the kind of the observational studies that are coming out, it seems to be quite uncommon. Um, but look, there it, it's a real risk, you know. I think, um, what they say, I think they say to avoid going too anterior, um. Because then if you go too anterior, you're kind of closer to your septal perforators as well. Um, but if it does happen, you know, you, that's why I always give contrast to make sure that you're not going up a septal perforator when you inject contrast. Um, and then, like we said, when you're looking at your impedance and your current of injury, if that dips, uh, if that drops, um, you know, then you're sort of in the risk of going through. So those are those are risks. Um the other risks like lead dislodgement, they're less likely than like you're you're eight times more likely to get a dislodgement with a his bundle pacer than with a left bundle pacer. Um and um yeah, I think the other risks are, you know, the potential risks really. Like again, like I said, we don't know how these leads 
uh, last for two, you know, over over decades. You know, we don't really know the mechanical wear and tear on these leads when we start to get, you know, lead fracture, especially in the ones which have which are styler driven. You know, and I think there's a bit more the studies. I think have shown a bit more sort of hinge point mechanical damage in those um, patients with styler driven leads than the luminous leads, um, which is something you know I was bear in mind. You know, with when selecting those, uh, which type of money use for the group, just to kind of elaborate yeah. on that, I, I think is what you mean is when you're screwed into the septum, it's where it actually bends at the septum, where it normally leads are built built to manipulate and bend. But if you bend them in a spot repeatedly where they're not meant to, you're going to have some degree of stress damage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what about uh, extractability stylet versus non-stylet? I mean, anyone who's extracted, you know, typically a stylet driven is nice because you have, you know, you can put counter traction. Um, do you do you foresee? Uh, I've heard these actually come out pretty easily, but we don't have any long-term data on this, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, again, you can only extrapolate from extraction of you know the the stylet driven leads, like the the Solia or the Biotron or the Boston leads for the stylet driven, and then for the thirty thirty for the Medtronic. Um, I'm I'm not a big instructor. Maybe Dr. Akaru, maybe we might be able to shed more light in terms of the thirty or thirty extraction experience. But um, that's from these talks. It seems like you know people say, well, if it comes out easy from the hips, maybe it should hopefully come out easy from the left bundle. But it's just a bit deeper in, I suppose. So. Um, you can you can only extrapolate really in terms of the extraction experience. Yeah, so I've only extracted like you know a few from the septum. Um, you know, I think basically what I found is that so for typical extractions, you're cutting off the header um, because you're putting a locking stylet through, and you're kind of um, doing your, your thing when you're extracting and pulling. Um, but for these, obviously, there's no, um, there's no lumen for you to put that through. So the secret is to take off the suture sleeve and not cut the header. because And then when you do that, that lead integrity stays the same. Now, the screwing, unscrewing part, that's the key, right? Because you know what you're hoping is that you're able to unscrew. And sometimes, if, I mean, if you're not unable to, then basically it's very inelegant. Really, all you're doing is pulling and snapping. And it's not, it's not, or it's not the best of, it's not the best of situations, I have to say. So sometimes it comes out, sometimes you basically have the tip and the screw stuck in the septum as you pull out. Um, and there's nothing really you can do about it. Yeah. Thanks for the insight there. Yeah. Um, so I guess one question then, and maybe both of you have had this experience. If you do have dislodgement, do you recommend because you're getting more tissue, pulling the lead all the way out and checking the helix to make sure there's no tissue bound there? Or do you just go right back up into position again if it's a acute dislodgement while you're still in? On oh, acute one? Yeah. Then in that case, I, I, I would take it out and see what's on the tip. And uh, I think because the thing is, if even if you bid on it, you know, when you go in again and you're not going to be, you're not going to get in as effectively, there's a sort of this um, concept of just rotating within and within, within, you know, in one space, you know, if you're not getting a good bite, say if your, your helix isn't fully cleared, um, that can be a problem. So yeah, I, I always take it out and make sure there's nothing on the helix. Oh yeah, for sure. Always take it out. I know for like RV septal dislodgements, we just a lot of times just put it right back where it was and try to screw it in again. It doesn't always come back. Really? Out, so no. I appreciate it. No, oh, I, yeah. I also this is, this always is... take that out. Yeah. <laughs> the only yeah, time really. where I don't take it out is if um, there was like an interval occlusion and I'm not in the mood to go through the whole extraction thing to get access again. Um, where I've seen within a month, you know, somebody's SVC, um, not SVC, sorry, somebody's subclavian kind of included. And it was like, well, either you get it in place or you don't. But um, but all the time, if it's dislodged, I take it all the way out. And put, actually, I put in a new lead. No, so I meant during the procedure dislodgement, by the way, not not acute at follow-up. But... Oh, during the procedure, I always take it out. Still. Do you? 
I think, um, and that's one thing, actually, this is more related to devices in general. Um, do you all maintain access with like an extra wire? Do you double barrel or do a retained wire? Um, just because I've, I've mm -hmm. heard of physicians a lot of times who go overseas do that just in case. Uh, would you recommend that or? Yeah, I, I, I retain. So um, as you know, I work with Dr. Mela and yeah, she's obviously a huge extractor. I know some people, um, and again, I don't know if the right or right answer about this, but like um, uh, we would use larger sort of sheath and then just put a body wire down into the um, IVC and then kind of get your lead beside it. Um, often means a bit more oozing during the case if you're splitting sheets and you know it's you know that can be the the flip side of it, but um, or the opposite, you could do the other thing where you just put a wire a sheath um you know put another wire through you take the whole sheet out and then go another wire um sort of put the sheet over one of the wires but um yeah i usually retain i usually kind of keep a uh, guess try and minimize as many sticks as you can um dutch Mela would say usually um that would mean you've half you half your chance of getting a pneumo you know so um yeah so that, that's that's so i, I do the same I actually don't. So, um, and I don't know why. I have actually have never even. That's an interesting approach. I've never actually even really thought about it. Um, and I don't know. I usually use the first rib approach. So I'm kind of I'm obsessive about getting my access over the over the rib. Um, so I'm not really worried about pneumos anymore. Um, so I, I just get the access that I need. And usually in the acute period, um, I, I'm fine. There've been rare cases where I've had issues with the, um, vein spasm, in which case I've had to double barrel, um, in which in those situations, sometimes I will put an extra wire down, but most of the time I don't. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer for this. And, um, you know, um, with the first rib approach, it's you know usually very very safe. You know, um, so again, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer over it. Really, I find it safe. But then, of course, I also I also do like a lot of like some people are like you're gonna get a venogram. I'm like mm -hmm. yes, every even as of like I've been doing this for what like six years, and every time I walk into the room, they're like, "Do you want a venogram?" I was like, "Dude, why do you keep on asking me that?" Yes, <laughs> I want a venogram. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. you know, where there's some people who don't use venograms at all. And so, you know, they're able to save, you know, contrast and whatnot. So it's it's really a matter, I think, of style and what you're comfortable with. Absolutely. You never know when that left persistent SVC is uh, on your table, I suppose, as well. Very true, very true. <laughs> they do the same. I think. Venogram I think. Time. I, I think in two, uh, Dr. Kura, you've, you've been doing this for a while. So I think uh, maybe in some examples where people are first learning, it might not be a bad idea to have an extra access when you're not as comfortable getting access to begin with, just because, you know, um, heaven forbid something dislodges, you need to be able to pace, things like that. Um, uh, I don't know, just things to consider. And obviously I'm not a physician, so I'll defer to whoever's instructing as we go to some of these locations, but uh, and in that case, if you're, for me, if you were going to get an extra for, you know, just as a backup, then I would use the double barrel approach and not get like, you know, you're doing a dual chamber, get three accesses, because then, you know, that would also increase your chances of, you know, getting a new mode. So that, that would be the approach I would use. Like for, I, I typically don't like double barrel, barrel just because I also extract. And in those cases, that's where you typically see the two leads kind of growing together. Um, so I typically don't like doing it unless I don't have to, um, unless I have to. But um, in that particular case, I would suggest, you know, doing that for um, the same reason that Dane said, you know, to decrease the chances of you getting a new model with access. And just for the group, just to explain those two techniques, um, I could. I wish I could draw a diagram right now, but uh, retained is where you actually leave the wire, um, the access wire with the lead. You just use a two, um, 
French size up from whatever the lead accepts. So if you use a seven French lead, you use a nine French sheath and leave the wire in next to the lead. That way, when you split the sheath, you still have access. So if for some reason you need to get back in again, you can just run a sheath over that wire that's separate. A double barrel is where you can use, for example, just a seven French sheath, go in with one wire, put the second wire or go over one wire, put the second wire in there. So you now have two wires or double barrel in the same sheath. You then pull the sheath off of both wires and put it back over one of the wires. It's just a way to retain access. Hopefully that was clear what I just explained with my background music. Very clear. Perfect. I, does anyone else have any more questions? I know we're getting pretty late in the evening, so I don't want to take up any more of anyone's Sunday. Maybe not. All right. Well, if you have anything else, just reach out in the chat. But uh, thank you, Dr. Sharif. Uh, this was fantastic. I, I definitely learned a lot. I'm going to watch this a couple more times because I, I need to get better with the 12 lead myself. Um, and then obviously, so, thank you, uh, Dr. Kuro, as well. As, yes, the same. As for, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. Thank you, AJ, for organizing the discussion. Thanks, um, We are still learning it. If you, I didn't ask any question, I want to read your slides and go through it and understand all the issues you raise. Then I will raise my questions. So I'm very appreciative of all that you have done today, sir. Very grateful to you and the team that set this up. Kudos to you all. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Dr. Daffy. Thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Zane. No yeah. problem. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. AJ. Thank you. Bye.